This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday morning. Welcome to Friday Morning Fellows Conference. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Quentin Lloyd, uh, one of our first-year clinical track fellows. Uh, Quentin did his undergraduate studies here in Atlanta at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, did medical school at Meharry. Uh, and then University of Miami for residency, where he did a year as, as the chief resident. And as you can see, today he's going to discuss the updated guidelines for the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. Take it away, Dr. Lloyd. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss these new guidelines with you guys. Um, so let's get started. So first of all, no disclosures. Um, and then, of course, like the objectives are here, so we're going to essentially identify the updates from the 2014 um, AFib guidelines. And there was a 2019 like uh, focused update, so a little bit of updates from that um, in regards to classification, risk uh, factor management, diagnosis, and then management of AFib. So jumping right into it, so essentially one of the biggest things for like the new um, guidelines is looking at the way we kind of like classify AFib. And so one of the biggest things that came about was that the previous classifications kind of focused on the duration um, of the arrhythmia and the new classification kind of um, focuses, uh, focuses on it as in terms of like a continuum, noting that uh, atrial fibrillation is essentially a, a, disease, a disease of progression rather than just based on its duration. And so some of the ways they kind of classified this are, oh wait, let me see. It's not, so it kind of like now focuses on the uh, stages of AFib. And so the stages kind of go from one through four with stage three kind of being like subdivided into four different stages, 3A through 3D. And so when it comes to stage one, it's kind of more so now focusing on like risk stratification and man management of risk uh, factors. And so both the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Um, so with stage one, you look at the patient's overall risk of, um, in terms of like their obesity, their exercise tolerance, if they have uh, comorbidities such as hypertension, renal disease, um, if they use alcohol, diabetes, if they have diabetes. And then you also look at like the, ge the genetics, uh, the sex and the age. Uh, generally the AFib population historically in the US at least has been generally older uh, white men. And so those are generally like the non non modifiable risk factors that we kind of that we kind of look into, but also kind of placing emphasis on the modifiable risk factors that I mentioned. Um, stage two kind of focuses on patients that have uh, pre atrial fibrillation. So these are patients that have evidence of structural disease or um, electrical abnormalities, but they don't yet have evidence um, of atrial fibrillation. They're just at higher risk of having it. Um, so these are patients that have uh, atrial enlargement on like their echoes, patients that have frequent like atrial ectopy, ectopy when we um, like do like routine uh, clinic EKGs, and then patients that have like the short burst of uh, atrial activity, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and then patients that have other um, supraventricular arrhythmias like atrial flutter. Um, and so that's kind of like where you consider doing like higher surveillance in these in this particular patient population. Um, and then stage three is kind of like what we kind of think of when we think of AFib, like the paroxysmal, the persistent, the long-standing persistent. And then now there's been like this kind of like new uh, category in terms of like ablation, which has been a big update um, in terms of like the newer guidelines. And so stage three, like I said, so that's kind of what we already know. So 3A is kind of like your paroxysmal AFib, less than seven days of onset, persistent AFib being greater than seven days, but less than 12 months, then your longstanding persistent being um, less than seven days to greater than 12, greater than 12 months, sorry. And then now this new category, like I said, being um, having had a successful ablation puts you in, in the category three, um, in the stage 3D um, staging. And then, of course, like stage four being permanent atrial fibrillation. And then the thing about this is that, like, throughout all of these, like, the biggest thing is that focusing on risk factor modification um, should be done from stage one through stage four. Um, and then kind of how we, like, manage uh, stage three, which um, used to be, like, the what we considered the classification of AFib, um, has changed a little bit in the up updated guidelines as well. 
And this is just another pictograph that kind of explains that as well. So the next kind of like take home point um, from the new guidelines was that the, in terms of like risk factor modification and prevention, the guidelines kind of focus on this like pillar um, that kind of focuses initially on the risk factor modification, but then also focuses on the, the exact management that we kind of focus on. So like uh, risk factors, stroke risk, looking at rate control versus rhythm control, optimizing the modifiable risk factors, and then kind of working on symptom management and kind of assessing the patient's like atrial fibrillation burden. So in terms of like uh, primary prevention, so it's a class one indication uh, in the new guidelines. So patients at increased risk of AFib should receive comprehensive guideline um, directed uh, life, lifestyle and risk factor modification for AFib, targeting obesity, physical uh, inactivity, unhealthy and unhealthy alcohol consumption, smoking, diabetes, and hypertension. And then this is kind of that pillar that I was talking about where they kind of focus on the, the modifiable risk factors and then kind of work their way up. And so they have like these mnemonics that they kind of use. So head to toes, kind of like looking at the mod mod modifiable um, risk factors um, and behavioral changes that patients can make to reduce their AFib burden. So heart failure, exercise, are focusing on treating arterial hypertension, uh, optimizing glucose control in terms of diabetes, uh, tobacco cessation, increased physical activity in terms of obesity, uh, reducing uh, alcohol consumption, and then sleep in general. And then also they kind of place a focus on having like shared decision-making between patients in terms of like the newer um, kind of recommended therapies when it comes to treatment of atrial fibrillation. And then again, like I said, you always want to make sure that you're assessing like the patient's stroke risk, opti optimizing their modifiable risk factors, like I said, and then again, um, focusing on the patient's uh, overall quality of life with their symptom management. And this can come in the form of rate control or rhythm control which originally used to be that rate control was the preferred go-to method, um, but that's kind of changed a little bit with recent studies as well. So the third kind of take-home point, so flexibility in using uh, clinical risk scores and expanding beyond the CHAS-VAS for the uh, prediction of um, uh, systemic uh, embolism or stroke. So CHAS-VAS is probably like, like the most um, studied, most validated uh, risk score um, clinical risk score for assessing like a patient's uh, risk of stroke, essentially. But like in the newer guidelines, it kind of focuses on maybe going beyond just what Chaz Vas provides in terms of like risk stratification and kind of focusing on some newer um, risk stratification in terms of stroke prevention. Um, so essentially, the guidelines say that for class one, uh, patients with atrial fibrillation should be evaluated for their annual risk of thromboembolic events using a validated clinical risk score such as CHAS-VAS-2. Um, patients with AFib should be evaluated for factors that specifically indicate a higher risk of bleeding, such as previous bleeding and use of drugs that increase bleeding risk in order to identify patients' uh, possible interventions to prevent bleeding on anticoagulation. Um, most notably, the whenever we think of like atrial fibrillation and like stroke prevention, we always like try to take into account the patient's like bleeding risk. Um, which there are like validated scores for like uh, looking at a patient's risk of bleeding. I think has bled being like probably the most common one that's used. But one thing that they say it, that's a class three that provides no benefit is that in patients who are deemed high risk for stroke, bleeding risk scores should not be used in uh, isolation to determine eligibility for oral anticoagulation, but only to supplement and to essentially be able, essentially focus on uh, modifying those risk factors of bleeding. Rather than saying, oh, this patient has a hazard of such and such, we shouldn't anticoagulate this patient for such and such region, especially in high-risk patients. And so these are some of the other scores that are um, used. So the, like I said, the chas vas is probably like the most validated one. But then the Atria and the Garfield studies are kind of like these newer um, risk factor um, clinical assessment tools that kind of assess the patient's risk of stroke. Um, and they include a, a few more things than the chas vas score does. Um, so they include age, um, sorry, they include uh, renal function, proteinuria are probably like two of the biggest ones. But the thing that, one of the reasons that these, some of the, the, uh, like bleeding risk scores um, 
are maybe not the best um, is the fact that they use a lot of things that can also promote embolism, but also promote bleeding as well, um, like a patient's age, hypertension, uh, renal dysfunction. Um, so it that's one of the reasons why they say to not use um, has bled and like the bleeding risk stratification scores um, in isolation to determine if a patient is eligible for anticoagulation. And so some of the additional risk factors that aren't included in the CHAZVAS score that, so that we should uh, be mindful to keep in mind when we're thinking about, about patients that are candidates for oral anticoagulation. So patients that have higher APA burden, longer duration, which there have been like recent studies that kind of like focus on this kind of like picture. Uh, persistent, permanent uh, AFib versus paroxysmal um, AFib is another thing to think about. Um, if the patient is obese, if they have history of HCM, um, if their hypertension is poorly controlled, they have low renal function, poor renal function, uh, proteinuria, or if, like I talked about earlier, if they have like this enlarged left atrial volume, those are um, things that you may also want to consider, but that are not included necessarily in the CHAZVAS score. So next, so uh, in the newer guidelines, the there's been like emerging evidence that kind of focuses on um, early rhythm control rather than rate control um, in this specific uh, patient population. And so one of the things that's in the newer guidelines that it kind of focuses on is like it focuses on looking at a patient's overall um, symptom burden and kind of seeing that and comorbidities that the patient has to kind of look and see what they have going on in terms of like their their underlying comorbidities. And so one of the things that the newer guidelines kind of focuses on is earlier um, risk factor modification, earlier uh, rhythm control. And so essentially this kind of comes from one of the newer trials, the East uh, AF uh, Net 4 trial, which is in, essentially was a trial that had about 2,700 patients that were randomized um, that were recently identified as having atrial fibrillation um, that were randomized to rhythm versus rate control. Um, and then basically, basically in this trial, initially patients were randomized to patients that were randomized to the rhythm control arm, um, 87% were treated with antiarrhythmic drugs and 8% with atrial fibrillation. But at two years, um, 35% were not on antiarrhythmic drugs that had received the atrial, um, atrial fibrillation ablations. Um, and then there's also data from like from this trial and large res res registries that have consistently shown the importance of monitoring for atrial fibrillation uh, burdens. Uh, which I kind of talked about. And so uh, essentially once AFib is identified, um, it's better to focus on early rhythm control in these particular patients and they're um, more likely to be more likely to be successful um, in terms of preventing AFib recurrence when the strategy is implemented early. Um, so similarly in the Cabana trial, which kind of like looked at um, catheter ablation, catheter ablation based rhythm um, control, um, and it was a, essentially in that study, it was a, the catheter ablation rhythm control was associated with a 46% 40, 40, reduction in mortality rate in patients with HF compared with medical therapy alone. Um, but we'll discuss that a little bit more later in detail. Um, so essentially for the uh, this particular group of patients, um, so which kind of patients do we usually kind of want to focus on when it comes to rhythm control versus rate control? And so this kind of table kind of like summarizes a little bit um, when we think about which patients should go to which category or which one we should focus on with which patient group. So generally like patients for like that favor rate control, it kind of breaks it down into the patient factors and then also the um, physical examination or the anatomy of the patient. And so in terms of um, characteristics that kind of favor, patient characteristics that kind of favor rate control, you kind of look at um, if the patient, what the patient prefers. So kind of looking at the patient's um, uh, using like that shared decision major, decision making that the guidelines kind of focus on. Uh, the patient's overall age. So older patients, you kind of want to focus on uh, rate control versus like rhythm control because sometimes the the rhythm control strategies may not be the best in those particular patient populations. Uh, so how long the patient has had atrial fibrillation is another big thing. Um, so the, like the longer the patient has had atrial fibrillation, you get more of that remodeling of the left atrium. And then that can kind of um, tell you whether or not the patient is more likely a candidate for rate or rhythm control. Um, and then overall, like the sy symptom burden for the patient. So if they're having fewer symptoms, you're less likely to use a rhythm control rhythm control strategy, more likely to just control the patient's rate if they're having fewer symptoms versus um, the the 
the vice versa for the patients that are having more symptoms. Um, then kind of like, like we talked about the physical examination and the anatomy of the patient. So patients that are having like difficult to control heart rate, they have like these smaller left atriums, more LV dysfunction and more AV, um, atrial ventricular, um, AV regurgitation. Um, you're more likely to use rate, rhythm control in these particular patient populations. And so this particular table kind of essentially talks about the, it's a, essentially a summarization of this table. So kind of like a decision tree when it comes to the treatment um, required to decrease a patient's AFib um, burden. And so in patients that, that do have heart failure, we'll talk about a little bit, um, but patients that don't necessarily have heart failure, you kind of use like a decision-making approach to kind of determine if the patient is a candidate for drug, drug uh, medical therapy, uh, catheter ablation or surgery. And so patients that are not heart failure and discussing with the patient um, in who in which antiarrhythmic drugs are not effective, one of the first line therapies um, would be catheter ablation for this uh, patient population. Um, outside of that, um, antiarrhythmic drug therapies receive a two-way recommendation um, in this particular patient population. Um, and then also same thing for surgery in this particular patient population. But the biggest thing is that in this specific patient population, catheter ablation has a, a 1A uh, recommendation for these patients. And then in terms of like the treatment algorithm for conversion of patients um, to atrial fibrillation, so normal LV uh, function, you kind of want to use our IV amiodarone and ibutilide as like a 2A and then procainamide as like a 2B. Um, in patients that have reduced heart failure, um, IV, amiodar IV uh, amiodarone is the, the two -way has a 2A recommendation for treatment in this patient population. And then if you have a patient that has atrial fibrillation that's occurring outside of the hospital um, in patients with a normal LV function, uh, you can use this so-called pill-in-the-pocket approach um, with flaconide or propafenone. But again, this, these are generally reserved for patients that don't have underlying structural heart dysfunction. Um, and then in terms of like maintaining a patient in sinus rhythm once they achieve sinus rhythm, um, so these are kind of like the medical medications that are um, given like 2A, 2B, and then three recommendations, which are kind of similar to the ones we know. Um, so again, in patients that have like the normal LV, LV, LV function with no history of MI or structural heart disease, you can use dephetylide, genetarone, fleconide, propafenone um, as a 2A and also amiodarone. Um, and then if patients do have the uh, LV dysfunction, prior MI, or significant atrial um, structural or um, structural heart disease, amiodarone and defetalite are going to be the, the biggest two that you'll use. Most notably, though, the one of the things, of course, that we know is that in patients that have reduced um, EF and uh, they are either uh, NEHA uh, stage three, uh, class three or four, um, or like a recently uh, decompensated heart failure, then dronetarone should not be used in this particular patient population. Uh, let's see. And then, so the next one kind of focuses on one of the bigger things that have come about the guidelines from the recent uh, 2014 and 2019 focused update. So catheter ablation in these guidelines receives a class 1A indication, whereas before I think it was 2B um, in prior recommendations. And this comes from a number of trials that have been um, done since then, um, or that were pu actually published around the time of um, the prior um, guidelines being released. So essentially for atrial fibrillation catheter ablation, class one in patients with symptomatic AF, when antiarrhythmic drugs have been ineffective, contraindicated or tolerated, and not tolerated or not preferred, um, and continued rhythm control is desired. Catheter ablation is a useful uh, to improve symptoms. Um, and then also in select patient patients, generally younger, like we talked about with fewer, com fewer uh, comorbidities uh, with symptomatic paroxysmal AFib in whom rhythm control is desired, catheter ablation is useful as a first-line therapy to improve symptoms and reduce, pr reduce progression uh, to persistent AFib. And then in patients with symptomatic or clinically significant atrial um, flutter, catheter ablation is useful in improving symptoms as well, or like the, the main class one indications. So outside of that, in terms of like 
patients that have atrial fibrillation and heart failure um, uh, thought to be due to arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy should be in which cardio arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy is suspected. Um, and an early aggressive approach to AFib rhythm control is recommended, uh, specifically using catheter ablation in this, in this particular patient population. And so in terms of like the class one indication, so in patients with who present with a new diagnosis of hef ref and atrial fibrillation, arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy should be suspected. And like I said, you want to consider early and aggressive uh, rhythm control strategies in these patients. Um, and especially in patients with who are on GDMT um, with reasonable expectation of procedural benefit, catheter ablation should be recommended in these patients um, to improve not only their symptoms, but their quality of, quality of life, ventricular function, and then their overall uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and then in terms of like the 2A recommendations that we have now, in, it's in appropriate patients um, with symptomatic AF and HEF-PEF with reasonable expectations of benefit. Um, catheter ablation can be useful in this particular patient population uh, to improve their symptoms and quality of life. Uh, that receives a 2A recommendation. And then a little bit in terms of like the uh, medical therapy. So in patients with AF and heart failure, digoxin is reasonable for rate control in combination with other rate controlling agents as or as monotherapy um, if those other agents aren't tolerated well. And then in patients with atrial fibrillation, HEF, REF, um, and refractory uh, RVR, um, who are not candidates for any type of rhythm, uh, or who are not con candidates for or in whom rhythm control has failed, um, AB node ablation and BIV pacing uh, therapy can be used uh, to improve symptoms, quality of life, and EF in these particular patients. So those last three all get two-way recommendations in the newer guidelines. And then this is kind of like a table that kind of summarizes those. Um, and so number seven, so in terms of the uh, um, atrial high rate episodes, um, that's another thing that's kind of been looked at uh, in the newer guidelines as well. Um, so these atrial high, upo, high ep, atrial high rate episodes, um, are essentially defined as these atrial events um, exceeding the program detection rate limited by limited set by the device, like in patients that have like pacemakers or defibrillators. Um, these are essentially recorded by implanted devices, but require visual inspection to confirm AFib and exclude other atrial arrhythmias, artifact, or oversensing. And then also this kind of like talks about the subclinical AF, um, which refers to arrhythmias identified in individuals who do not have symptom symptomatic um, symptoms attributable to atrial fibrillation, but uh, in, in whom there's no previous AKG documented um, atrial fibrillation, but the patient has some type of wearable, such as like a face, um, some type of uh, device, implantable device or wearable um, that shows uh, evidence of uh, atrial fibrillation. They just haven't been symptomatic from it. And so in terms of this newer, um, kind of discussion when it comes to these atrial high rate episodes. So in terms of like 2A uh, recommendations, so for patients with device detected atrial uh, high rate episodes lasting greater than 24 hours and with a chas vask of two or more um, or equivalent stroke risk um, using either that atrial or the Garfield score, um, it's reasonable to initiate anticoagulation um, with a shared decision-making framework for uh, patients for this duration. And this table kind of like summarizes essentially um, that recommendation. And so essentially what this says is it kind of looks at the patient's overall risk um, using that chads uh risk assessment clinical tool, and then kind of looks at the overall duration of those subclinical AF and uh, atrial high rate episodes, and then kind of determines if the patient is, is a candidate for uh, atrial fibrillate, is a candidate for uh, anticoagulation. And so circle A essentially are patients with short and like these infrequent um, atrial high rate episodes. These patients don't necessarily, and that, that are low risk, these patients don't necessarily require um, anticoagulation. Um, B, uh, for circle B, uh, these are essentially like patients with intermediate risk um, that also have these atrial high rate episodes lasting greater than six minutes, um, but less than 24 hours. It's not really clear necessarily in this patient population, um, but they're on where their patients should get anticoagulation, but there are studies underway. And then uh, circle C is kind of like the patients that are at high risk 
um, with like these longer, greater than 24 hour um, high atrial episodes, high atrial um, rate episodes. Um, so these patients should get uh, anticoagulation. Um, and so for the high risk population with uh, the AHRE and the SCAF buried in between six to 24 minutes, um, at the time these guidelines were made, there was kind of like lacking evidence to know if patients were candidates for anticoagulation. However, there were like two studies that were published um, um, that, well, the results came out not uh, recently, um, that kind of suggests maybe not doing anticoagulation in this particular patient population. Uh, one was the Artesia and the other one was NOAA. And essentially uh, in the Artesia trial, it was looking at among patients with subclinical AFib, um, and a pixaban essentially resulted in a lower risk of stroke or systemic em embolism than aspirin, but resulted in a higher risk of major bleeding in those uh, particular patients. And then the NOAA trial, essentially showed that among patients with these atrial high rate episodes uh, detected by uh, devices, implantable devices, uh, anticoagulation with adoxaban didn't really reduce the incidence of, um, it was a composite of cardiovascular death, uh, stroke, and sy systemic embolism um, as compared to placebo, but it resulted in higher incidence um, of major bleeding. Um, but the incidence of stroke was relatively low in both groups. Um, so essentially, in that particular patient population, anticoagulation might, may not be the best um, for those patients, but definitely in the patients that have the high risk and then these uh, HO high rate episodes lasting greater than uh, 24 hours. So um, patients without a prior diagnosis of AF, so again, like in terms of 2B and 3 uh, recommendations, so there is a 2B recommendation for patients with um, device detected uh, atrial high rate episodes currently between five minutes and 24 hours that if they have a high um, risk with the trans or whatever other clinical risk assessment tool you want to use, um, it may be reasonable to enter early uh, patients um, in this particular patient population. I think this was public. This was essentially in the guidelines before we had the data from the uh, um, Artesia and the NOAA trial. And then uh, again, of course, there's really no benefit in patients that have these atrial high rate episodes with uh, duration lasting less than five minutes to anticoagulate them. And so again, another thing I know, like uh, at least for me, I've been on echo and like we have like a lot of neurology uh, colleagues that prefer getting uh, TEs and loop recorders in patients that um, have stroke of unknown etiology. Um, so there is a 2A recommendation um, for that in patients with stroke or TIA of undetermined cause um, for doing in initial cardiac monitoring and if needed, extended monitoring with um, an implantable loop um, are reasonable to de uh, improve detection of AFib um, in these particular patients in which you don't know the etiology of the stroke. So number eight, so left atrial appendage occlusion devices um, actually receive a higher level um, a recommendation um, I think before it was a 2B, 2, but now it's a 2A. And so in patients with AFib, a moderate to high risk of stroke um, based on like the TRASVAS or whatever clinical risk assessment score you use and a contraindication to uh, long-term uh, anticoagulation, um, it's reasonable to, um, with a non-reversible cause, it's reasonable to use these percutaneous um, left atrial uh, appendage occlusion devices, uh, namely like the Watchman is probably like the most common one that, we, that we'll see used. And so in terms of like those long-term anticoagulation uh, contraindications, so severe bleeding due to non-reversible cause involving the GI tract, pulmonary area, pulmonary um, system, GI system, um, spontaneous uh, brain bleeds um, or intraspinal bleeds, and then any serious bleeding related to recurrent falls when it, um, when the cause of the fall cannot be is not a is not felt to be uh, treatable. Um, so I know those are like some things we think about when we think about starting anticoagulation in our patients as well. Uh, number nine. So recommendations are made for patients with atrial fibrillation identified during um, medical illness or surgery. So there's emphasis made on the risk of recurrent AFib after AFib is discovered during non-cardiac illness or other precipitants such as surgery. Um, so essentially what this is saying that in our patients uh, population that has that there's oftentimes where we have patients and they're acutely ill and we get consulted for these patients that develop this like new atrial, new uh, quote unquote atrial fibrillation. Um, 
So in terms of the guidelines, they define precipitants as either an acute infection, cardiac surgery, or non-cardiac surgery. Um, and essentially in two studies, this came about because in two studies, um, they looked at the recurrence of AFib um, in patients that atrial fibrillation was first discovered during their acute illness or non-cardiac surgery. And the recurrence was 42 to 68% in the acute um, medical illness group and about 39% in the non-cardiac surgery group during a five-year follow-up. And then what they saw was that regardless of the initial precipitant through, uh, through these studies, they've shown that recurrent AFib was associated with increased risk of uh, heart failure. Um, and then there was also a retrospective study looking at about 3,800 patients with AFib um, and sepsis admitted to U.S. hospitals that kind of used the CHAZVAS score and showed that the CHAZVAS score was a poor predictor of acute stroke risk and that parenteral, uh, parenteral anticoagulation did not really reduce the risk of stroke um, in these particular patients. Um, and then also that the risk of stroke did not differ whether patients had pre-existing AFib or new onset AFib. And so essentially for the prevention um, of AFib after cardiac surgery, so in terms of like the two-way recommendations in patients undergoing cardiac surgery um, who are high risk for post-operative AFib, it's reasonable to administer short-term uh, prophylactic beta blockers or amiodarone to reduce the incidence of post-operative AFib. Um, and then patients undergoing cabbage, aortic valve, or ascending aortic aneurysm um, operations, it's reasonable, to, it's reasonable to perform a concomitant posterior left pericardiotomy to reduce the incidence of postoperative um, atrial fibrillation in these particular patients. Um, and essentially for, for me, like I didn't know, but like I guess like the pericardiotomy um, is an option for prevention of AFib. And essentially allows for the drainage of the dependent blood and pericardial fluid um, into the left pleural space, which is essentially where that it's thought to be that what's irritating the left atrium to leading to the post-op AFib. So th those both receive a two-way recommendation. Um, and then in terms of treatment after um, cardiac surgery, so in post-operative cardiac surgery patients, oh, it's kind of like what we talked about already. Yeah, so that's that. And, and then that kind of talks about it also. So in terms of like acute medical illness and uh, including AFib in the critical care setting, um, so these one, the class one indication for this specific paper, patient population is that patients with AFib who are identified in the setting of acute medical illness or surgery should be consulted, uh, counseled about the significant risk of uh, recurrent AFib after acute illness is resolved. Um, and then at least like 2A recommendation in patients with AFib who are identified in the setting of acute medical illness or surgery, outpatient follow-up for thrombolic um, risk stratification decision-making on OACs or on OAC initiation or continuation, as well as AFib surveillance um, can be, be beneficial um, given the high risk of AFib recurrence in these particular patient populations. And then in terms of like acute medical, in terms of uh, kind of management in patients that have uh, acute medical illness or surgical illness, um, this kind of like kind of summarizes that uh, uh, what we were talking about just now. So in terms of patients that have an acute precipitant, uh, which was like earlier defined, um, in patients that have uh, risk factors and comorbidities uh, for atrial fibrillation. So patients that have acute AF, so you want to focus on treatment of the acute uh, precipitating uh, fa uh, factors or triggers. Um, and then in terms of like the, the symptom burden and kind of managing the patients from an atrial fibrillation standpoint, you want to focus on a rate of rhythm control strategy, of course, and then you want to focus on uh, stroke prevention in this uh, patient population in the acute setting. When it comes to care transition, um, you also want to counsel the patients regarding their risk of uh, AFib recurrence and then to continuously follow these patients uh, outpatient. Um, to assess their risk of uh, AFib uh, burden, and then kind of focusing on a rhythm monitoring um, strategy, whether that be with a, um, a wearable or an implantable loop recorder, um, and then kind of like essentially focusing on the lifestyle and risk factor modifications you can uh, mitigate with this particular patient population. And then lastly, kind of focusing on a specific, on sp the guidelines focus on specific patient populations that weren't necessarily um, talked about in prior uh, guidelines. So specifically in patients with hyperthyroidism and atrial fibrillation who have an elevated risk of stroke uh, based on a standard clinical risk score, anticoagulation does have a one, there is a 1A recommendation for anticoagulation um, in this particular patient population until the thyroid uh, dysfunction um, is resolved essentially. 
And so that kind of stems from the fact that oftentimes we'll have patients that we're consulted on that have uh, hyperthyroidism. And we often tell our colleagues to, hey, control their hyperthyroidism first. And then the atrial fibrillation essentially sh should get mm -hmm. better. Um, and most trials have shown that at about a median of one to three weeks after thyroid hormone levels have returned to normal, um, usually patients have a re spontaneous reversion back to sinus rhythm. Um, but in this particular patient population, it is reasonable um, to give them anticoagulation, um, especially like it's been shown in like laboratory findings that patients that have hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism also have laboratory studies that focus, that suggest uh, a higher uh, coagulable state as well. Also in athletes is another. Um, so in this particular pop patient population, um, it kind of focuses on PVI ablation for these patients. So there's a two-way recommendation for in patients with in athletes that develop atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation with PVI is a reasonable um, strategy for rhythm control because of its effectiveness um, and low risk of detrimental effect on exercise capacity. So essentially where this came about was that there it's been shown that with moderate levels of exercise, it's been associated with lower incidence of AF, but these high volume endurance um, athletes, um, which essentially is defined as greater than 45 metabolic equivalent uh, hours per week, um, has been actually been associated with higher prevalence of AFib, uh, particularly in young athletes. Um, it's not really fully known like the mechanism um, of why this does happen. Um, it's thought to be maybe related to like atrial myopathies from like exercise and do stretch or like inflammation. But there um, have essentially been no studies have really looked at the exercise moder moderation, um, but sometimes that's proposed. Um, and then generally athletes will often choose to continue their high intensity sports um, and not really want to take medications because usually these patients are a lot younger. So that's kind of how this catheter ablation like young athletes um, um, came about um, with a two-way recommendation. Um, let's see. And then lastly, um, in terms of like the pregnant population, so this re wasn't really mentioned in, there was no really mention of, uh, pregnancy and atrial fibrillation in the prior guidelines, but at least in like the newer guidelines, um, in pregnant patients with AFib, uh, direct current cardioversion is safe in patients, is safe to the patient and the fetus, um, and should be performing in the manner that you would do any other patient, um, in patients that, in pregnant patients that require, um, cardioversion. Um, and then in terms of like the medical therapy, of course, the biggest thing is that you want to avoid um, medications like amiodarone in these particular patient population when you're considering medications to give them for um, rhythm management, um, but usually like sotolol and flecainide um, without any other underlying structural heart disease is safe in this uh, patient population. These are the references and that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Gwen. An important topic and a lot to digest there. Um, you know, for me, I guess, you know, the, the the sort of making catheter ablation class one is sort of the headline. And I, and I think it's good they address this sort of uh, officially address this sort of very low burden AFib group. You know, now that we have wearables and more implantable monitoring devices, you know, what do you do with these folks that have like, uh, you know, just a, a few seconds or a couple minutes of AFib here and there. And, and I'm glad they address that. W one thing, uh, just sort of a, a smaller thing, but something that caught my eye, and I hope I read this right. This is back, this goes, this is back towards the beginning, your slide about any arrhythmic therapy. Um, it's interesting. I, I saw amio for patients with a normal heart, they had amiodarone as a 2A and sodalol as a 2B. Uh, yeah, they're on the left. Um, yeah, I think I read that right. Anyway, I, that just caught my eyes. Like, oh, that's interesting that they would prefer amiodarone over sodalol in a patient with, you know, a normal heart. Um, I guess maybe just cause it's more efficacious. Uh, you know, I don't know if you, uh, they, they commented on that or if you remember anything about that. Uh, not necessarily. Maybe that's the way it's no. always been. I've just never known that, that they would. I, you know, I just think, I don't know, just probably not, not what I would do, uh, in practice, uh, for, for this group, but anyway, just any, any thoughts you had there? Yeah, I think at least like when I've been on, um, my rotations during my brief stint as a fellow, uh, I think like 
patients that have like um like some type of uh structural like heart dysfunction like we usually like shy away from using soda oil but i could be wrong uh, if someone else wanted to come uh robbie you right. deserve uh that catches my eye too and uh we really don't do that. I mean, maybe he's an inpatient. But I'm sure in, I was going to say, maybe he's sure, an inpatient. But for long-term yeah. outpatient therapy, that would be a little... That would, that would I'm be sure uh, in Europe they do that, though. So uh, yeah. it's not like the Europeans were uh, voting here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, again, maybe for short-term therapy, you know, peri-procedural or after a blade, you know, like, again... I could see short-term amiodarone use, but in terms of like long, chronic and chronic drug therapy for someone with a normal heart, I don't know, just amiodarone, we just don't, we just don't do it very often uh, for long-term maintenance of sinus rhythm and patient with normal LV function, no prior MI or no prior structural heart disease, mm -hmm. not, not really done uh, in, in, in practice. So Robbie, Stan, you know, it's, it's, they're both twos. It may just be that there's more data on amiodarone than there yeah. is data on sodalol, but I'm with you. I, you know, uh, and I think we're with all the EP guys that amiodarone is not the first thing they pull out, but over sodalol. Um, I've got a question for Quentin. What, what about mitral valve disease? I didn't see it at all in here. Uh, I, so they kind of did talk about it in terms of like the anticoagulation, but I didn't like focus on it um, for this particular presentation though. Yeah, there was that part where they talked about AV disease. And I think they meant, H, you know, I don't think that was, that wasn't aortic valve, right, Quentin? I think you said that. I think it was atrioventricular valve regurgitation right. yeah. uh, as, as a sort of risk factor for recurrence. Or or consideration, uh, there you go, like down at the bottom there. I think that that refers to mitral or tricuspid valve regurgitation, and when you're favoring rate control versus rhythm control. But you're right; they didn't they didn't go into it much. Quentin, this is Mahmoud Abdu. Um, back to that antiarrhythmic slide. Uh, one thing that also caught my eye is the indication for sutalol uh, in patients who have a re uh, reduced EF. Um, if I remember correctly, Sutalol was a class three recommendation uh, based on the SOAR trial. However, now they have it as a class 2B in those patients who have reduced CF. So that's another thing to highlight. Um, okay. uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah, I, anecdotally and in practice, sometimes uh, in conjunction with EP, we sometimes use Sutalol in patients with with heart failure. However, it was kind of outside of the guidelines, but now you have a class 2B recommendation, so. Right. All right, well, um, thank you everybody for tuning in this morning. Thank you, Quentin, for an excellent review. And um, hope everybody has a great uh, rest of their day and we'll see everybody uh, next Friday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.